Welcome to Main Street Church of the Nazarene, Toronto. We are pleased that you are joining us on our YouTube channel today. Pastor Bruce and Pauline are on holidays, and we are sharing a message by Reverend Danny Morano, who is a senior pastor at the Generations Church of the Nazarene in Oakville. He has been with them since March of 2016. We trust that you will be blessed as you hear from the word this morning. And I would invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to each one of us. We thank you for the way in which you have met all of our needs through this past week, individually, as family units, and corporately as congregation. We thank you for those needs that you have met, people who are not part of a congregation, but join us on our YouTube channel. Your blessings are too innumerable to count. Heavenly Father, we pray that as we spend this time in your word today, that you would use it to challenge us and to stimulate our thinking and to encourage us in our Christian walk. May we become more and more Christ-like disciples. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey guys, greetings from Oakville. We are excited that we can be together today. Um, I'm going to be sharing this word with you, and I know that you guys have been having a great service so far, and God is doing some great things, and He's going to continue to do great things during the week. So I'm excited. Every time I get to share the word of God, it excites me. It, 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 it fills me with so much hope of what God can do, not because of what I say, but because the word of God is life. And so I want to dive straight into the word with you today. If you want to Check into your Bibles or reach into your Bibles or turn your Bibles on. In Luke chapter 13, we're going to be reading a story from verse chapter 10. But first, I want to pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful day. We thank you for all the great things that you are doing, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be able to hear and receive your word today. I believe, Lord, that you're going to speak in a profound way. And I know, Lord, that your word is life. And it can do something special inside of us today, Father. So speak to us through this word. And just shape us and form us for your glory, Lord. Thank you for this time. In your name we pray. Amen. So today it's, it's exciting. We get to speak from Luke chapter 13, verse 10. I want you to reach into your Bibles and, and we're going to read along. I read um, in the New King James Version, whatever version you're going to read along, we're going to pick up on a few pieces of this story. And it says this, it says, Now he was teaching, so Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. And he said to the crowd, there are six days on which men ought to work. Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. The Lord then answered him and said, Hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it for 18 years. Be loosed from his bond on the from this bond on the Sabbath, and when he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the multitude rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. So, as we read this story, obviously it's pretty straightforward. There's a woman with a spirit of infirmity for 18 years. She was crouched over, couldn't get up on her own. And she comes into synagogue one Saturday uh, on the Sabbath. Or, well, I mean, if you want to get really technical, let's just use the word Sabbath. Because if you want to talk about which day was the Sabbath, the Sabbath was just the seventh day. So, if you start work on the Monday, then what's your seventh day? I, I don't want to get into that whole conversation. But for them, let's just say it was the Sabbath. And so she walks in on the Sabbath into synagogue and that day they had an invited guest who was Jesus who was teaching there. And when he saw her, he stops everything. He calls out to her. 
and says, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. Then he goes up to her, lays hands on her, and she was made straight, and she could stand up straight from then on in. Then chaos occurs. Because the, 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 the ruler of the synagogue, the guy in charge of the synagogue, let, let's put it into context. Let's say that it was our church and so this is church and so what happens is Jesus is the invited guest of church. You know, sometimes we think to ourselves that that would be the greatest thing, but I, I, I got to tell you that I've been to a lot of churches many times where I would say that Jesus would probably not be asked back if he was the speaker that day. And so because of the things that he had to say and so he's speaking this day in church and this woman 18 years has been going who knows how long she's been going to church and she just can't get up on her own and she has this spirit of infirmity that's just over her that's oppressing her keeping her down and she comes in this day and Jesus sees her and he calls out to her and he says you are loosed from your infirmity goes up to her lays hands on her she gets up everything is supposed to be a Amazing, but at that moment, the pastor gets up and says, hey, 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 today's the day of rest. You can come any other day. So remember, he doesn't actually speak to Jesus. He speaks to her. And he says to her, you could come any day to get healed. Why did you pick today? Why did you come on the day of rest when you could have been healed on another day? And so then Jesus says, well, you know, you guys are hypocrites. How could you take care of more of animals and, and, and think of them and think of their livelihood? And this woman comes to be healed and she can be healed. And so then it says that they were put to shame and then Jesus sort of wins the argument. Well, he always wins the argument. And so there's three different things that I want to sort of point out in this uh, story. I want to sort of look at three different perspectives from the three major characters. The first one being the woman. This is one of the most... Uh, beautiful ways to look at this story from the from the eyesight of this woman when she herself walks into church I don't know how many years you've been going to church you may be watching a sermon for the first time you may be watching thousands of sermons all the time you know nowadays with COVID and and with uh, the lockdowns people go to church a lot more than they used to except it's online right people are watching services from different churches from different places and so you may be very churched over church or never been churched. I don't know what your situation is, but I can tell you something. This lady, she walks in to church seeking something. She was reaching out through her, through the depths of her pain and trying to make it in. She made it. She made it to church. That, 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 that in itself is wonderful. You know how many times we, we, we look at the situations that we're in and we don't even worry about about making it to church. I know that right now is probably not the time to tell people that they need to go to church because you can't really physically go. But wouldn't it be beautiful that if after this lockdown and after things sort of calm down, people would be so excited about being able to go back to church that there would be no excuses. It wouldn't be one of those situations. Well, it's just a nice day today. Well, you know what? I was gardening last night and yesterday and, and I went to sleep a little bit later and a little tired and I can't make it out. But this woman presses forward through a spirit of infirmity for 18 years and makes her way into the house of God to hear the word of God. She has an attitude of expectancy for what God can do. She couldn't look up on her own. And, and you know what? I would go as far as to say is the fact that she makes it there to synagogue on the Sabbath, even though she's been dealing with a spirit of infirmity for 18 years, it shows not only that she is willing to go, not only that she's expecting something to happen, but I truly, truly believe that, 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 she, that she realized that the answer did not come in herself. Do you see how beautiful that says there? It says, it says there that, that there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. 
I, I think that that's the story of all of us and sometimes we don't realize it. Sometimes, because physically things can seem okay, sometimes even when the bank is okay, the account is okay, the payments are going in on time, everything seems like it's okay, we think that we can raise ourselves up on our, on our own. But the truth is that we've all been in this situation. We are all in this situation. This lady is all of us. She is the person who cannot get up on her own. I, I, I realize that this is me. It means that when I come to church, you see, that, that's how I come. I have to be expectant because I know that I can't get up on my own. I know that it's not about me. It's not about my strength. It's not about how great I've been. God doesn't look at me and say, hey, you've been a pastor for all these years. You know, here's a gold star. It, it doesn't work like that because none of us, none of us can get up on our own. And she knew that. Maybe she was very aware of it because of the spirit of infirmity, but she was aware of it. And yet she comes to the house of God. Yet she comes to receive something. And I, I just love what, what Jesus does because he, he stops everything. And, and, it's, and it's amazing that, that he doesn't see anything else, but he sees her. He sees her. I want to tell you that even in those moments where you are very, very aware of the fact that you can't get up on your own, Jesus sees you. Right now, there where you are, maybe you've been dealing with a difficult week because of COVID, because we all get this exhaustion and this fatigue and, and we don't want to stay home all the time and we don't want to be, you know, we want to be able to do the things that we did before. Maybe you've been out of work. Maybe you're a business owner and, and you haven't been able to make ends meet because everything is on lockdown. Maybe there's so many things going around and you can't get up on your own. I want to tell you that Jesus sees you he sees you right now. He sees what's going on. He sees the situation. He stopped everything. He saw her and he called out to her. I want you to know today that what you're doing now by hearing a message and, and, and opening your heart to whatever God is doing, you're doing the right thing because we can't get up on our own. But Jesus is here today to heal. Jesus is here today to do the work in our lives that we need. And it may not look the way that we want it to look. And that's okay. But he knows what he's got to do inside of us. Second uh, perspective that we see in this story is the perspective of the ruler of the synagogue. And see, this all happens and, and, and Jesus heals this lady and then this ruler of the synagogue answers with indignation. And he goes to the crowd. He doesn't, he doesn't speak to Jesus. He speaks to the crowd. I, I think that he didn't want to talk to Jesus. Right? We, we have to think about it this way. If he was the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus was teaching, it's because he invited Jesus to teach. Maybe he was a little embarrassed about everything that was going on. So then he goes out to the crowd and he doesn't want to deal with Jesus right now, especially because this guy just healed someone. So you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what the guy can do to me. So I'm going to talk to the crowd and I'm going to tell them, why did you guys bother him? Why did you guys come here on, 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 on this day when there's six days when you can work, when there's six days that things can happen? And today, today you pick today. You know, sometimes we don't realize that the ruler of the synagogue might not be such a bad guy. You know, if we had, so we're, so, we're so used to good guy, bad guy, right? We're so used to watching the TV shows and all these things. And then we see these characters change from good to bad or they're the bad guy. Or actually, they look like they were a good guy the whole time, but they were really the bad guy. But then maybe there's one guy who th you thought that was bad, but he turns at the last minute and he becomes a good guy. And so everything is okay because he's a good guy at the end. And so we, we make people switch from good guy to bad guy. And we don't realize that it's the same guys, the same girls, the same people 
that we can just switch sometimes and make the wrong decision. So this ruler of the synagogue, he comes and he's actually having Jesus come and speak. That's actually a point in his favor. Second, he's also trying to keep order. That's another point maybe in his favor. The problem isn't that he's trying to keep order or that he's actually thinking the wrong things. It's the thing. The problem is that sometimes some things supersede others and we don't get that. You know, one of the problems that we have in church today is we're too churchy. We're too, we're too enveloped in the way that we think things are supposed to be that we are so, uh, so, so indignant whenever something doesn't work the way that it's supposed to work. You know, I know that you guys may not have this problem, but you know that if you hear about other denominations, they have problems with people who have issues with different kind of songs sing, sung in church. And sometimes I laugh at that because you know that, that the songs that we sing in church aren't for us. They're for God anyway. So as long as he likes it it doesn't matter which song you like or don't like right and and sometimes we get so indignant because we want church to be the same way it was when we remember it to be when we were kids and grew up and the way that it's supposed to be in these songs and this way and and this liturgy and this this and this that and this that and those things may be good things to have you see order is good the spirit of the spirit of god is spirit of order things can work out well but there are things that supersede others and sometimes we sweat the small stuff Sometimes we could get so enveloped in things that aren't the, the priority that we get so, so, so concentrated on important matters that we forget about what's of utmost importance. We forget what we're really supposed to be doing. How we're really supposed to be acting. So many times we could be the ruler of the synagogue. We could be that person who's saying, okay, listen, 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 listen. This isn't the way things are supposed to be run. We didn't do this this way. That's not what the, sorry, I was going to say, that's not what the manual says. That's not what this says. That's not, that doesn't follow Robert's rules. That doesn't follow this. That doesn't follow that. And we could be so, so concerned about the rules that we miss out on the opportunities that God is giving us to see transformation in lives. You see, transformation of people's lives and the work of the Holy Spirit and whatever God wants to do, whenever he wants to do, takes precedence over everything. It takes precedence over everything because it's his way, always. The right way is always his way. And yes, it's in the Bible. Yes, we're going to go into the word and we're going to read the word and we're going to believe everything the word is going to say. But sometimes we could get so caught up in our interpretation of things that we don't allow God to teach us that he has something more important that he's doing. How many times have we been the ruler of the synagogue? How many times have we been so uh, concerned or consumed about the material that we forgot the supernatural? That we were so concerned about doing things the right way that we forgot about the miraculous that God wants to do. You know, God doesn't have to fulfill our agenda. He doesn't have to do things the way that we want him to do. And so many times we could be this ruler of the synagogue. And I, I, I don't know what happened to him after. It doesn't say what happened to him after. I, I would hope that the indignation turned to repentance. And then he followed in a different, uh, with a different attitude he followed Jesus. I, I hope that that really was what he did. But then the third perspective that we see here is Jesus. The attitude that Jesus took towards this situation. Now, first and, first and foremost, we, we've already said it, right? We said what we said. We, 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 we know that he went to speak to the crowd, but instead of speaking to the crowd, he got caught up and he saw the woman's need. And instead of, instead of directing himself to the crowd, he directed himself to the need of that one person. 
Now a lot could be said about that and you guys know it. You guys know that he is the great shepherd. That he'll leave the 99, go for the one. That's what he's about. And so this shouldn't surprise us about this message. That that's what he did. But then after he spoke to the crowd, he went and he spoke again to all of the people who were, who were sort of talking against him. And he said, hypocrite. Actually, no, he, he said to the, to, the, to the ruler of the synagogue, he speaks to him directly and he says, hypocrite, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox? Now, all of you do different things to try to keep, you know, your, your animals alive and all these other things and, and you do what is essential at this moment. Why can I uh, heal my own daughter? And so what, what here is actually happening is that we're realizing that Jesus, not only does he see the need over and above the crowd, he's also, also changing the conversation. And, and he's done that a few times. Every time that you see that Jesus does something and people criticized him because his healing became, he did healing on the Sabbath or he did whatever he was supposed to do on the Sabbath or the day that he wasn't supposed to or where he, he, he heals the lame man and, and he picks up his mat and walks and they get angry at the lame man for having carried his, his mat on the Sabbath. And, and so we see all these different things and we think to ourselves, okay, well, what was happening at that moment? Well, you see what, what these people were doing, these Pharisees, what they were doing was they were having conversations and they were interpreting the word of God for the Sabbath so that they could bring rules to the people. Basically what they said was, okay, what we're not supposed to do is we're not supposed to work on the day of rest because the day of rest is for work. So you are not supposed to do anything that, anything that, that is considered work. So then they would go deeper and say, well, there's things that are human needs. So anything that is not essential for life, essential for survival, essential to live, then those are the things that we can't do. So some of them would say, okay, you couldn't take more than 200 steps. No. Some of them say, well, you couldn't carry more than this amount of weight if you're walking somewhere. You couldn't do this. You couldn't do that. So anything, anything at all that was deemed work was anything that was not essential for life. And so the, the, the Pharisees would get together in groups of people and they would talk about what was essential. And they would come to agreements and say, okay, well, well, you know what? What is essential is to eat and to drink and to whatever. So what is not essential? What is work? And they would start to debate what work is. Okay, so walking more than 200 feet, that's work. Okay, no, no. If you carry some food, but it's not for your own consumption, then that's work. Or if you do this or you do that, then that's work. And so they would sit around and they would have a conversation about what work was. And so they would define work and they would say, this is work and this is work. And you can't do this because this is work because their conversation revolved around what work was. But here is Jesus who comes in on the scene and he doesn't come into the conversation to try because because Jesus was a teacher of the law. So Jesus comes in and instead of debating what work is, he changes the conversation completely because that's what Jesus does. He changes the conversation. So while they're talking and defining what work is, Jesus goes back to that and says, well, work is anything that is not essential for life. And he says, well, I didn't come to define what work was, but I did come to define what life was. And so then he comes to this and he says, well, this is life. The life that I give includes healing. Jesus says in John 10, 10, I have come that you may have life and life abundantly. So he didn't come to, he didn't come to, 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 to give us an interpretation or a definition of what was work. He came to define life. He came to define life. And what he saw was this woman, when she couldn't do it on her own, and she came to her wit's end, but showed up to see him, he saw her. And he made sure that she could live. Better than she could have lived for those 18 years. Today I want to tell you that God wants to do the same thing. Jesus is here 
to do the same thing today. He wants to redefine your life. He wants to show you what true life really is in a relationship with the Father through the work of Jesus. You see, because that's what real life is, is when we recognize that life is a life reconciled to God our Father. Where He fulfills all our needs in our prayer life with Him and the things that He does in us, but it's only through the work of Jesus. It's only through what He does. And so He showed up. The question is, are you going to be like her? And despite all of the things that you've been going through for so long, are you ready to show up for Him? Let's pray. Father, I thank You. Because I know, Lord, that You want to speak to everyone's heart today. And You want us to come and surrender to You. When we can no longer do it on our own, that we would come to You and You will see us and You will give us a new life. Thank you for this time, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen.